Welcome, this is Ad Emmen reporting live from our four meters below sea level studio in downtown Almere. Today we will talk about the Russian supercomputing days that this year didn't take place physically in Moscow, but did take place uh, virtually. We will especially look at this, the session on the second day with uh, the main keynotes about the future of HPC. The session was chaired by Vladimir Vuvudin, um, who had uh, three uh, speakers to introduce. The first one was Thomas Lippert from the Unix Supercomputing Center, who was talking about European uh, developments, mainly praise. The second one was uh, Matteo Valero, who is from Barcelona, and who was talking about the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center activities in high performance computing. The third one was Jack Donguera, and Jack Donguera shared some insights about the top 500 that he didn't tell us before, which was quite interesting. But the first one was uh, Thomas Liepert. So Thomas Liepert was looking at, uh, at Europe from uh, his uh, uh, Jülich uh, center. And one of the things that he is talking about, because he's now uh, uh, chairing that, uh, is about praise. And praise is the um, organization that takes care of distribution of computing time uh, from European supercomputers to European researchers. So, and most of the counties in Europe are already member, uh, with the um, small exception of the uh, Baltic states. So, what are the computers that they are now today distributing? The computing time, not the computers themselves, that are the national uh, tier one systems in a few uh, big countries. Um, as you know, there's also EuroHPC, which will install systems, but that's called the, um, the tier zero, and th those systems will not come available until early next year. So, uh, praise, um, uh, Thomas, uh, by the way, you can see that he really did present it because I, I leave his uh, picture on top. It's his presentation. Um, he, uh, he mentioned some praise achievements like the uh, number of scientific uh, projects enabled, uh, the number of uh, peak uh, uh, petaflops uh, performance that they have now. It's um, about 110 petaflops on seven uh, uh, systems um, and some 12,000 people that have been trained until now during the past years on praise. Then he was turning his attention to the systems that they have in Jülich, so it's his uh, computing center. And um, um, there, there, there are a lot of developments, so they started with one monolithic machine, and actually in the end, I, I tried to make it a little bit bigger, you can see that now they are currently having several uh, uh, modules, subclusters that they connect together in some kind of fashion. Because it's quite difficult to see, we also, he, he also have uh, had an uh, abstract uh, picture uh, with it. Um, so basically, um, he is a, a kind of uh, advocate of modular computing. So Thomas said that uh, you should have modules for, uh, let's say, standard clusters, multi-tier clusters, uh, modules for neuromorphic computing, etc., and then connected by uh, a modular interconnect, which makes it possible that you can use several of the modules for a specific ap application. But depending on the application, you, to, you take different modules and uh, connect them together. So currently they have, uh, for instance, the, the Jules uh, cluster, um, which is a 12 uh, petaflops uh, system, and they have the um, Jules booster, which is more kind of specialized uh, uh, system with the GPUs. And the booster has a performance, peak performance of uh, th uh, 73 petaflops. So it's, it's all, all uh, big, big systems, big modules in themselves, but tying them together uh, it gives you flexibility. During the Q&A, Thomas Lippert said he expected an exascale system in Jülich by the end of 2023 or perhaps in 2024. Then it was time for a short discussion uh, with uh, Vladimir and uh, Jack Rungera, Matteo Valero, and uh, also uh, Thomas Lippert. Then it was 
time from Matteo Valero to tell a little bit about Open, because he's an advocate of open hardware. Um, but he started with telling a little bit about his center, so the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And if you look, you can see that mm, actually they are already up to 722 people and still growing wor that, 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 that are working in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. When they started back in 2006, they had uh, something like 65 uh, people, so they are growing really fast. And actually, it's kind of difficult to find a European HPC project that does not involve um, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. The um, working horse today in Barcelona is the Mare Nostrum 4, but um, Matteo stressed that actually it's not one monolithic machine. It looks a little bit like the modular supercomputing, but actually it's much more connected. Um, but they have uh, s several subclusters um, for uh, several uh, different kinds of uh, applications. So, it's and they, he, he, he stressed again that with the money that they had for the Marnostrum 4, they could have made it perhaps even to the top one or the top two of the top 500, but they didn't want to do that. They just want to have a globally usable machine. We'll come back to that. Open. Um, if, if you think, if you consider that to be important, then open hardware is still a problem uh, in Europe. Uh, this is a kind of uh, overview that that uh, that uh, Matteo uh, did give. So you have from uh, TRL uh, one to two, that's basically experimental systems, to TRL eight uh, to nine, that are machines that are or systems that are uh, mature and can be used in production. And then he has this overview that basically everything is already fine and in production. Memory, mm, I'm not sure that it's really already at the, at the TRL level, the storage and interconnects. There's not so much hardware there in Europe yet. There is some, I'm, I'm, I don't say there's nothing, but anyway. But according to uh, Matteo, the big red box is the CPUs. So the, the CPUs in Europe are at TRL 1 to 2, so basically just research type of things. What he is advocating now is to use uh, uh, RISC-V for that, and he said, why RISC-V? Well, it's the best choice, and what's the disadvantage of RISC-V? Well, it's also the worst choice. Basically, there is no choice if you want to go open and have um, an architecture that is already relatively widely used. So why does Europe need its uh, own processor? Well, he says, th these are uh, Matteo's uh, uh, words, of course, uh, processors now are, are everywhere, so they control uh, each and every aspect of our lives. Um, you have to, uh, for security, mm, there could be back doors uh, that are in processors that you don't know if you don't do design them yourself. There is, um, of course, um, future restrictions on exports. We, sh we now see that basically the uh, US administration uh, forbids everything in processors going to, the, to, uh, to, to, to China. So even a chip, manufactu uh, chip manufacturing s a system machine manufacturers that have problems delivering machines because if they deliver them to China, then it's threatened that they cannot deliver them to the US, etc. So it's, it's really a big, uh, big problem, according to uh, Matteo. And um, of course, um, a competitive uh, a European supply chain value chain for HPC and will create jobs, he says. He talks a lot to politicians. These are the current activities in the, in the uh, 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 accelerator and CPU landscape. So basically, they have this uh, RISC V um, CPUs and accelerators that they're working on. Um, and there is also a new project that has just started that's an e processor. An e processor is the basic RISC V processor. So, not an accelerator, just a complete processor. That project has just started, I think, a month ago. The um, 
uh, main activities in which uh, BSC is involved is um, the uh, European Processor Initiative. So there are two phases uh, from that. And they also have now put in a, a European proposal for a uh, European pilot. So a, a pilot system using this kind of uh, architecture. So, and this is his com uh, picture to, 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 to get to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to exascale with, uh, with that. Let's go back to there. So this is his, his picture to, uh, to get back to, uh, to, to, to exascale, um, starting from the European Processor Initiative and then having um, the MEEP, talk about that later, the e-processor, et cetera, until we reach exascale based on European technology. So the European Processor Initiative was the, the first one. The first phase already uh, started a few years ago um, and um, Barcelona was involved in that. Um, a little bit less perhaps than they suggest. Matteo suggested that he was the inventor of it. Well, there are people in some other countries who beg to differ a bit. The uh, accelerator that they are building in EPI, well, there was already some other um, presentations that we that we showed uh, about uh, this. So it will be a RISC-V based, uh, there will be a factor core, um, and there will be, if you, if you look at the, at, at the participants, there will be participation from, from several countries. Um, so uh, there will are several countries working and, and many partners working on a complex project like developing an accelerator. Um, Matteo said that, well, he didn't really like that too much because he preferred to have a big project where he could decide for himself what to do and that the other partners just would do that work. And now it's a European project, so everybody brings in his own technology, his own ideas, you discuss, you discuss, you discuss, and then everybody creates stuff and then bring it together and then you have a European Result, I think that's the way that European projects work. But Matteo, Matteo would like to see that he gets a big pile of money and just decides on his own. Um, one of the uh, things is that, uh, so they have this uh, pre exascale system, the minus system five, one of the three that are uh, around, the other one's in Italy and the third one is in Finland. But they also have an experimental uh, exascale platform called MEEP. And MEEP is basically an FPGI engine to, to, to emulate uh, hardware architectures and hardware that they want to have later on in the um, real uh, processors implemented then in hardware. So the Mar Nostrum 5, that's one of the three, as I mentioned, one of the three pre exascale supercomputers, should be, should be online somewhere early next year. Um, the interesting thing is that what um, Matteo said is that he will use the same kind of um, architecture as the Mar Nostrum 4, which means having different uh, uh, smaller systems which together connected deliver the whole uh, Mar Nostrum 5. And as good as that may be for applications, it's difficult with such a type of machine to reach the top. So they didn't want to reach the top in Mar Nostrum 4 because they wanted to emphasize applications, but uh, Matteo said that he also don't want to reach for the top, but want to reach for application applications with different kind of modules connected in one system, which makes it very difficult with that amount of money to reach the top five. And as you know, the goal of the European Commission with the whole Euro HPC endeavor and with the pre exascale systems was to have uh, three uh, systems in the top five. Mm, difficult if the Marnostrum doesn't play along, but we'll see. Um, as said, the, uh, there's also recently a, a project started, a European project started for the e-processor, and that's a processor which can be used for HPC, for AI, and some other, other, other things like bi bioinformatics. 64-bit, um, 16-bit, so basically what you expect. A, a, a general, not very general, but a, a rather general purpose uh, processor based on RISC-V under development now. 
Um, uh, this is not yet under development, but the next phase of Euro HPC is to have some pilots, so have big uh, uh, systems, which integrate European hardware already, and in a kind of pilot demonstrating uh, that, that you could reach exascale with, with if you would scale up such a pilot. Um, the proposal has just been put in, but uh, Matteo Valero is so confident that they will be accepted that he already shared the details. If you put everything together, then you can see that um, actually uh, uh, reaching exascale with this uh, European technology will still take some time. And actually, if you look at the uh, dates, then you see that there will be a flagship accelerator program based on risk five that should be part of the next framework program. Um, and that should somewhere 2026, perhaps even later, um, deliver results. So European exascale system based on risk five technology, mm, just 2026, perhaps even later, according to the presentation of Matteo Valero. So that was his presentation. Then there was Jack Nogera, and well, we already had uh, some um, some uh, coverage of uh, Jack Nogera's analysis of the top 500 and the analysis of the Fujaku system, the number one. In this presentation, he, he had, uh, of course, he highlighted the, uh, the, the Fujago system again. Um, he also uh, said that there were a, a, a lot, well, compared to the number that you have in the top 10, which is 10, um, uh, new systems in the top 10. There was, however, a record low in turnaround in the top 500. So there were only 51 systems dropped off. Normally there are many more, but in this top 500, the, the, the June 2021, only 51 dropped off, which is really low. Um, so that showed that there were not really much investments made. And because the investments most of the time are, were already done last year, it doesn't have anything to do with COVID. It's just that people don't invest that much. And one of the reasons in high performance systems in the top 500, and one of the reasons is also that, as, as uh, Jack Nugera noted, that there's a big difference between the top 100 and the 400 ones that are making up the total top, top 500. The top 100 are research systems. There's a lot of development there. And that um, once uh, in a while that shows in the top 10. And these machines are completely different from the 400 systems which are then in the lower parts of the top 500. And the systems in the lower part of the top 500 for a big part are not really even used for high performance computing, but for a big, um, uh, let's say, data center uh, type of applications. So what did uh, Jack say? Well, if he would have done it over, he wouldn't have created, uh, together with, with the other people from the top 500, a top 500, but they, they would probably have made a much smaller, let's say, a top 100, because that would really much more have a focus on high performance computing and not have the big, more general data type of uh, computer systems in them. Um, of course, he also showed the, uh, the uh, top 500 uh, uh, developments. So we are close, but not yet there. We are not yet at exascale. And because it was at the uh, Russian supercomputing days, he also mentioned the two Russian supercomputers that were in the top 500. And one of the things, of course, is that um, um, he, he's a real benchmark guy. He likes to benchmark machines and get into the nitty gritty. Why are systems performing well or why are they not uh, uh, performing well. And um, one of the new things is, well, it's not that new, but one of the uh, uh, things which, which attracts attention there as an alternative to the top 500 is the HPCG uh, results. Uh, that's a different benchmark, which much more captures the modern type of applications. So that was the, uh, the uh, presentation from, uh, fr from, uh, from Jack Nogera. 
And then they started discussing, which was nice, the, the, the three of them. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't get uh, Thomas Lippert uh, online, so I think that would have been an even more lively discussion. Anyway, I think that was the, uh, the close of the um, supercomputing days, the Russian supercomputing days, which, by the way, part of it was in Russian, translated automatically into English, and part was English, automatically translated in Russian for the, for the keynote. So I, th I think that was, was done very nicely. So perhaps we will do an, 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 an other report on the supercomputing uh, days in Russia. And if not, go there next year, And because it's really uh, an interesting uh, event. And of course, stay tuned to our channel for more reports on high-performance computing, for more uh, reports and interviews with uh, HPC uh, uh, people. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you around. For Premier Magazine, this was